Hello everybody. An introduction to systems thinking, which seems to be a rather difficult subject for people to understand and follow. Let's have a go anyway. What is systems thinking? Well, it's simply thinking about the world around us, about situations and problems, and how things might, could, should, or even do work as open interacting systems, networks of systems, and hierarchies of systems of material or immaterial things. System thinking can be surprisingly revealing. So it's thinking about emergent properties, capabilities and behaviours, how they come about, what benefit they might be, what problems they might create, and it's unravelling the inner workings of complex systems especially non-linear, so real world. But first, what is a system? Well, there's many definitions, and it's not as easy as you might think. So as a general one, let's try a complex, organised whole of interacting material or immaterial things. So there's some key words in there. Complex, organised, whole, and interacting. So a script is a system, a car with a driver is a system, a person, an organisation, and of course the solar system. Systems exist, function, behave, show emergent properties. These are properties of the whole that cannot be exclusively attributed to any of the parts. <clears throat> or as Aristotle would have it, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, the part is greater than a fraction of the whole, which has been said to be the cornerstone of system thinking. There are different aspects of systems. They could be open or closed, hard or soft. They could be self-organised or man-made. Closed system has an impenetrable boundary, which is a theoretical concept used, for example, in thermodynamics. A hard system is one made from material things, technology, machine-like, whereas soft implies human and immaterial, uh, for example organisations, human activity systems and teams. They may not always do the same thing or perform in the same way. In other words, they behave a bit like humans. Self-organised implies naturally occurring solar system, flora and fauna, ecosystems, you and me. So is an organisation of people hard, soft or self-organising? Is a car without a driver a system or is it an artefact, a tool to serve a human's purpose? Or is a car plus driver a system? After all this combination is autonomous and purposeful so it could be a socio-technical system, perhaps. At this level of, of organisation, uh, on the left-hand column there you can see the standard thing many of us learnt about in school, and the right-hand uh, man-made systems, and um, there seems to be some correspondence between them. Going to the left-hand column, for example, as we all learnt when we were young, tissues are formed from the emergent properties of groups of cells. Organs are formed from the emergent properties of groups of tissues. Organ systems are formed from the emergent properties of groups of organs. And the organism itself is formed from the emergent properties of groups of organ systems. And man-made systems on the right-hand column seem to correspond. This suggests, to me at least, that it should be perhaps a biological metaphor for systems engineering rather than the mechanical one which is in vogue. Systems are generally open, exchanging energy, information and substance with other similarly open systems. So there is a continual flux through any system. And systems adapt to the interchange. So systems form networks of interacting systems Systems form hierarchies of systems within systems within systems, and all are dynamic, shifting, 
and shimmering. So what's the point or value of systems thinking? Well, it will help us to understand complex, complicated things or situations or problems. Hence, we might be able to explain emergence, behaviour. We should be able to resolve problematic situations. We can use system thinking to establish systems design requirements for cooperation, coordination, complementation, consonity and control of and between subsystems. And then there's that flux of energy, information and substance through a system. We should be able to explain, explain counterintuitive behaviour, unintended consequence, with a view to avoiding them or perhaps exploiting them. In short, we need systems thinking to help us get to the heart of the matter, whatever that matter might be. So the point of value of systems thinking seen from an academic viewpoint. You can see system of thinking top dead center and when that is formalized it leads to systems theory which promotes systems thinking. Systems theory uh, uh, feeds into other disciplines which promotes systems thinking. When systems thinking is used in real world applications it helps promote management effectiveness and it improves the effectiveness of problem management. Hmm. The first principle of systems. The properties, capabilities and behaviours of a system derive both from its parts and from the interaction between those parts. The corollary to the first principle. Altering the properties or behaviour of any of the parts or any of their interactions affects other parts, the whole system and interacting systems. And you can see from our uh, image of the human there with all his internal organs showing what the various organ systems might be. And you can immediately see how the first principle and the corollary uh, would apply. Methods and methodologies. How to go about systems thinking. One of the key methods uh, for system thinking uh, in an organised uh, way is causal loop modelling. It came about by thinking um, about cause and effect. In the first of these diagrams at the top you can see cause having an effect, um, another cause having a different effect and a third cause having another effect. And no relationship between these various relationships. So this is a disjointed viewpoint and it's one you'll find politicians taking quite a lot because they don't want to know about uh, the fact that the cause may give them an effect and that effect may cause problems with other causes. Uh, on the other hand there's the uh, linear control viewpoint. A cause results in an effect which becomes the cause resulting in another effect which becomes a cause resulting in another effect and so on. That, that's a sort of uh, chain. And in fact the real world doesn't work like that. We get causal loops where cause and effect results in another cause effect which feeds back on the first cause effect and so on round in circles. Now this is obviously non-linear. Uh, it's based on a form of feedback and it's much more like what goes on in the real world. For example, now here we have a, a classic uh, causal loop model. There's an inner loop there from births at the left and births increase population and as population increases we get more births. So there's a positive feedback loop there uh, marked by the positive symbol in the brackets. Now if we look to the right we see that population as that increases deaths increase. Well, more population, more deaths. And as deaths increase, population reduces. So here we can see the relationship between births and deaths as they affect population. Births increase population, deaths reduce population. If the birth rate and the death rate are the same, then population would remain constant. If uh, the birth rate increases 
uh, but the death rate doesn't, then the population is going to go up. But as the population then goes up, the death rate will inevitably uh, increase as well, so you then get to a new level of population. Um, you can then look at the effects of things like uh, increasing the amount of space. Population takes up space. The more population, the more it occupies the available space. Uh, available space seems to have an effect on increasing the birth rate. But um, available space also has the effect of reducing disease. We can see that in the negative sense where crowded conditions result in more disease. So uncrowded decisions, less crowded dis uh, conditions, uh, reduce disease. And disease, of course, has an effect on deaths. And there's a similar relationship with population uh, eating into the available food. Uh, more food results in more births, and more food reduces deaths. Um, so, well, certainly from starvation. So you can see the total food supply and the total space both have a fairly sophisticated and complicated effect uh, on the overall pattern of births, population and deaths. Some very sophisticated, complex ideas in there all related in a very simple diagram. Notice that conventionally uh, the open-headed arrows result in a positive relationship, whereas the filled-in arrows result in a negative one. Here's something we're all very familiar with, uh, the body temperature regulation. Bottom left we can see uh, body temperature, and body temperature can rise as a result of in illness uh, or exertion. And as the temperature of the body rises, perspiration increases. We're now in the centre loop at the bottom. As perspiration increases, the perspiration should evaporate. And in evaporating, it takes away, it um, absorbs the latent heat of evaporation from the surface of the skin, thereby reducing the skin temperature. And that feeds through to result in body regulation, temperature regulation. However, that evaporation, the rate at which you evaporate, depends on local humidity. If local humidity is high, the evaporation will be low. And sometimes perspiration doesn't evaporate, it drops off as sweat droplets. And with air, whether it's by evaporation or by sweat droplets, uh, sweat, sweating reduces the available body fluids along with passing water. Uh, the available body fluids um, prevent us being dehydrated and dehydration results in temperature rise. So if you can see around there we've got controlling loops. We can regulate the temperature provided we keep uh, plenty of uh, available body fluids which means we have to take water. So, for example, people running in a warm country uh, on marathons will take lots of fluid at regular intervals to make sure they've got available body fluids so they can perspire and it can evaporate and come off as sweat. A very simple look at Darwin's survival of the fittest. In the green we can see prey at the top. At the bottom we can see predators in red. And in the middle you can see the interchange between them. Just have a look at the diagram and you'll see how it works. We've got prey fitness results in variable inheritance. So prey variation, some of which will be strong, some of which will not be so strong. And the weaker ones are eliminated by predators. The same seems to work the other way around. If we think about uh, predator fitness, that results in variable inheritance, predator variation, and you get elimination of weak predators because they can't catch the prey. Uh, eliminating the weak leaves the other predators fitter. And so you get co-evolution of uh, prey at the top and predator at the bottom. Simple interesting. Here we can see co-evolution working uh, 
uh, a bit more uh, simply. You have to really look at this diagram to understand it. What we have is uh, insects and flying insectivore mammals trying to catch them. Uh, insects then take to night flying, which results in night flying bats trying to catch them. In order to catch them at night time, the bats develop sonar so they can navigate at night and bat predation goes up, except that uh, some moths have started producing their own sonar so that when they hear um, the bat sonar signals, they create their own jamming signals, which confuses the bats so as they miss. Only the bats then produce uh, more subtle sounds that are harder to jam and round and round we go, uh, co-evolution of bat sonar and moth sonar jamming. So flying insects evolve smart bats and bat sonar evolves smart moths. Co-evolution. Truancy. There's a need to reduce truancy and you can see this first of all at the top in a so-called laundry list where we take truancy as the objective and we look at the number of uh, things that would contribute to uh, truancy as a laundry list. And this is normally presented in uh, pejorative terms. So lack of parental discipline, lack of school supervision, dull and interesting lessons, lack of lessons aimed at a particular student's needs, and a, a somewhat unfortunate glamorous perception of bunking off. By informing the causal loop model we eliminate the pejorative terms. So down at the bottom left we now see need to reduce truancy as the uh, trigger as it were. And we can see that um, results in school supervision, uh, coordination and parental discipline, control of students resulting in reduced truancy level. We need to be able to measure truancy and we need to revise teaching methods to reduce truancy. We need to have sessions to de-glamorise truancy to reduce truancy level. And we need lessons aimed at truant student needs uh, to reduce truancy level. So we can actually see all together we've got a bit of stick and a lot of carrot. The stick is in increasing the parental discipline and the carrots in all the other threes as shown by the solid headed arrows. This is for organisation and method. Here the desire is for increased efficiency and that um, creates a perceived shortfall efficiency. I mean you don't have a desire for increased efficiency unless you think it's not efficient enough. So there's a perceived efficiency shortfall. Establish efficiency targets, develop strategies to achieve those targets, create a plan to achieve the strategy, provide resources for the plan, implement the plan and then measure the efficiency against the targets. If you get, uh, if you're successful you get a perceived efficiency shortfall and it's reduced. Perhaps it doesn't reduce as well as you like so you can then develop an alternative strategy and go round again until you end up with zero perceived efficiency shortfall and you no longer have a desire for increased efficiency because you've achieved it. Belief systems. Uh, basically two loops here, one at the top and that more complicated one at the bottom. Let's look at the personal beliefs the top system. A belief system gives a straightforward believer's world model which allows them to interpret uh, everyday events and situations. Uh, it reduces their psychological uncertainty and so reinforces their belief system. This um, belief system doesn't have to have any grounding in truth. Uh, we've uh, seen before that the ancient Egyptians uh, used to believe that a giant invisible beetle, dung beetle, raised the sun every morning. Uh, they believed that um, and sure enough every morning the sun rose, which reinforced their belief in this peculiar idea. However, 
we can now look at what happens uh, in the social group beliefs, which is the lower half. Uh, belief system uh, tends to give um, create role models of so-called good and so-called bad behaviour. Uh, and that lends itself to cooperative social behaviour. Uh, there are rewards and punishment concepts for being good or bad. And usually belief systems are associated with some sort of icon. Uh, things people wear, for example, cat badges, regimental colours, um, religious objects, crucifixes, whatever. Uh, all of that results in cooperative social behaviour, social cohesion, which results in the development of power structures, which tend to reinforce the icon. And power structures result in usually an indoctrination or education system in the beliefs, which reinforces the belief system. So the lower half is all about um, spreading the belief system amongst social groups so they all tend to believe the same thing, either because it's highly believable or because they're indoctrinated and educated into the belief system. Belief systems. Complicated. One of the first examples of system thinking I came across was cues. The idea is simplified and generalised. There's no mention of any technology, no mention of who or what is queuing. Queuing theory is concerned only with what a queue is, the different ways in which queues can behave, and the outcome from different behaviours. So systems thinking about queues is applicable to, say, a supermarket checkout, or the tennis crowds waiting to get into Wimbledon, a serial data highway, or data links, or anything where queues form. It used to be done using mathematics. And I learned this all as a young engineer, um, and used to carry these formally around in my head because they were so useful. Lambda is the mean arrival rate of items in the queue. Mu is the mean uh, rate of items being serviced. So the mean channel utilisation is lambda over mu equals rho. Then the number in the queue is given as an average of rho divided by 1 minus rho. So if rho is 0 0.5, then Q is 0 0.5 over 1 minus 0 0.5, which is 1. And the number in the queue and being serviced is given by the formula 1 over 1 minus rho. So if rho is 0 0.5, then the number in the system that is in the queue and being serviced is 2. 1 in the queue, 1 in the service channel. But when lambda equals mu, then beware. Rho equals 1 and q equals infinity. So when we get into parallel queues, and queue behaviour, where people get impatient and leave queues, maths for multiple queues can get tricky. Now here we have a stellar diagram on the left of a simple FIFO queue. That's first in, first out, but with leakage from a conveyor. You can see the symbol for queue there, and the service channel there and the service sum, that's items that have gone through and reached the other end. Uh, and there's a leakage sum there. You can also see that there's a timing from the arrival to coming out of the service channel. So you can actually work out the mean time for items to go through the system. We have mean arrival rate, which we can vary here, and mean leakage rate, which we can vary there. On the right here we have uh, an image of a control panel. Control for mean arrival rate, control for mean leakage rate, and here's some graphs of the result. This one shows uh, the um, accumulation of items having gone through to the service sum or to the leakage sum. Um, so you can vary lambda and the mean leakage rate, uh, and that gives you the mean service rate since um, Lambda plus the mean leakage rate, oh sorry, no, lambda minus the mean leakage rate is the service rate. 
Graphs for service and leakage sums, of course, but they're also not shown. Graphs for mean time end to end, and graphs for the number in the conveyor at any instant. You can experiment with various queuing parameters, and you can do many, many runs. Hence, you can build models of not just this simple FIFO queue, but of serial and parallel queues for more parallel applications, for more complex applications. System dynamics. That was a former system dynamics we showed in the previous slide. This one's a very simple example, using Stella again. We can see at the top left a bank with a flow, with a tap on it, of um, payments into an account. And then we can see outgoings from the account um, uh, with fixed expenses going to, well, going to an infinity symbol there, which means we don't know where they go. We're only interested in what's in the account. So we start off, as it says in the bottom left-hand panel, being broke and we've got a job. Uh, and we're going to have a job for uh, one year and we get paid each month in arrears. And what is in our account then ends up as on the graph at the right. You can see nothing in the account until the end of the first month. Then we get paid and our outgoings kicked it and the out paid, outgoings, paid, outgoings and so on until we get paid on the end of the 12th month and no more income and gradually it fades away to zero. There's a simple way of looking at a bank balance. It gives you very accurate information um, and the shape of the curve here, with that curve on it, may be not quite what you would have expected. Another example of um, Stella at work, this time looking at chaotic behaviour. Uh, at the top here we have a causal loop model showing what happens when uh, um, a, an atomized public are fed disaster news time and time again with successive disasters. Each time a disaster is, uh, is announced it causes the society to go into some sort of uh, chaos but that decays away to get back to stable. People get uh, uh, get used to these things. Then there's another announcement of another stable, another disaster goes away to chaotic decay. Then another disaster but before this one can die, die away another one comes too soon and the suggestion is from the model that you then go unstable. It goes right off the top there. Okay so this is what's called self-induced media frenzing and here we can see that within Stella we can generate chaos as well as instability. This is, uh, uses another technique called interpretive structural modelling. Here what we do is we've uh, looked at the objectives for railways, for example, of a number of potential stakeholders. And we can see that uh, they would all like robust systems because that results in less track, track maintenance so you get more trains on time. Uh, and with reliable trains you get uh, fuller trains, greater profit and potentially more pay. Reliable trains allow you perhaps to have more trains going all the time, more leisure trains, more frequent trains, less crowded trains, more satisfied passengers and job security. Now on the left here we can see who has which objectives. For example if we take the green, we can see what passengers would like is more frequent trains, more leisure trains, less crowded trains. If we look at station staff, or on the other hand, station staff would like satisfied passengers and job security. Drivers and guards would like more pay. Signal and rail staff would like robust systems, reliable trains, trains on time, less track maintenance. Business is the interesting one. Business would like fewer trains, fuller trains, leading to greater profit because they don't have to run so many trains and they would be full. Well, there we go. And we can see that there are all sorts of different people here, but we have looked at the whole of the state, uh, all of the various stakeholders, and produced 
a, a model of the way that their various um, objectives relate to each other. And looking at the overall pattern from that, one has to say that it's at all, not at all clear. There is a dichotomy. The business objectives are, seem to be widely incompatible with those of both passengers and staff. And one therefore has to ask, is this really a private commercial business or should it remain a public infrastructure service? That's a dilemma. And certainly different countries have quite different ideas on how that should be done. Modern policing. At top left we can see uh, ordered society. That's everybody who behaves himself. And then top dead centre we have disordered society which is brought in, which results in crime. Uh, crime leads to antisocial activities, fear of crime and disordered society. Out of disordered society you also get people going to prison and when they come out of prison they go back into disordered society. And as you get population turnover, you also get disordered society. So where do the police live in all this? Well, the police have two sorts of action. They've got um, action um, against crime, action against social activities, and action to try and reduce the fear of crime. And many policemen will tell you that fear of crime is more of a problem than actual crime. And then on the right we have crime results in reported crime. There's a lot less reported crime than there is actual crime. And then reported crime allows the priest to react and they detect the crime. If they detect the crime successfully, then there's what's called this reactive spiral, that people will report more crime because uh, it, got report, it got reported and detected. So there's what's called a reactive spiral and it can work either way. If they report crime and it's not detected, then people will be less inclined to bother to report it. And as a result, that goes down rather than up. And detected crime results in people going to prison. So we're down at the bottom here. We can see an equation which police people get uh, quite excited about. The disordered proportion, P, is the disordered society divided by the ordered society plus the disordered society, which would be everybody. So we've got public drunkenness here, there's these antisocial activities, breaches of the peace, rowdy behaviour, winos and druggies, noisy neighbours, youth congregations, drug dealing, living and sleeping rough, tramps and beggars. Hmm. Interesting subject, modern policing. Policing within a democracy. Now a different uh, technique altogether. This is called the n-square chart. Uh, there are n columns and n rows making n-squared, hence the name. And on the leading diagonal we have the basic uh, parts of a system. Functions or subsystems, whatever we're trying to represent here. So A, B, C, D, E, right the way down to J, are all either internal functions or subsystems of one single system. The whole diagram represents one system. And you can tell that because all the parts are interconnected. How do you know they're interconnected? Because of the interfaces. All the outputs from A are on a horizontal. All the inputs to B are on a vertical. So the output from A and the input to B is there. That's the interface between A and B. Likewise here we have the interface between A and D, and here we have the interface between F and E. This represents what's called a waterfall. C waterfalls down to D, waterfalls down to E, waterfalls down to F, and you can also get the reverse coming up here like that. So it's more like a, an escalator. And we also get things where we have a number of functions and interfaces between all of them and we get what's called a functionally bound block. If you notice here, nothing goes into A but it all comes out, so that's a source. Similarly, down at J here, nothing comes out of J 
and everything goes into it, so it becomes a sink. The n squared chart. You will see in a moment, I think, how useful it can be. Here, here's a word n squared chart. This is looking at something that we don't know that much about. It's a hunter-gatherer family and we want to see how they would work. And I've shown on here grandmother, father, mother, daughter and son. Grandmother because there is reason to believe that grandmothers were important in uh, our early hominid uh, nuclear families. For a start, we know that the grandmother lived longer than the grandfather and still does to this day, on average. Anyway, you can look through this and you see what uh, grandmother does. Grandmother gives support, help with gathering, raising children to mother. Grandmother gives guidance and education to daughter and guidance and education to son. Father gives security, meat, sex and love to mother. Mother gives love, home, food, sex, babies, support to father. Mother gives love and affection to grandmother. Father gives security to grandmother. And so on. You can go around here and see how it all works as a whole. How they bind together into one unit, the nuclear family. Uh, and how they work together, how they cooperate to create a secure family home. This is a different um, type of n-squared chart. This is actually uh, from the Channel Tunnel uh, for our Notional Crisis Management System back in 1988. And this is a tool for dealing with n-squared charts. And you can see here, this is a direct uh, printout. And these are uh, obviously abbreviations, damage control interval, activity sensors, environmental sensors, baggage inspection, safety control, rail operations, intelligence, immigration, local police, emergency services. And this is somewhat all over the place. We can see there is a leading diagonal. But all these interfaces, and the numbers in there representing how important the interfaces are to operations, uh, are all messed up. So let's see if we can reorganise it to bring some organisation. After all, a system is an organised device. And there we have, we've clustered it. And what we've done is produced, uh, uh, used a clustering method and employed a generic algorithm to tease out the optimum configuration, reviewed in the architecture. You can see at once this is a lot more tidy. There's a functionally bound block there. And here's a system node around K. There's another little system there, another little system there. When you look at K, it's operations, which is at the node. Well, that's not really too surprising, is it? We've got baggage inspection and customs forming a little system there, which is what you'd expect. Damage control and logistics there forming a little system because logistics have to supply whatever's been damaged or resupply. Very powerful method and also gives you that rare thing, a complete overview of a single system, no matter how complex it is. Let's view a wide variety of methodologies. There are, uh, there are many, many methodologies. We'll look at a few. The first one is Checkland's soft systems methodology. And you can see that it consists of uh, things going on in the real world and things going on in what's called the systems thinking world. We'll follow around the numbers. One is uh, somebody going into the real world, an analyst, and finding the problem situation but unstructured. In two, the picture of the problem situation is a precursor to possible purposes for a system. It can either be a new system designed to alleviate the problem or a redefinition of an existing system. By the time we get to three, we form a root definition. One is developed for each of the systems uh, and it describes six key aspects of that system and they're formulated around the acronym CATWO. C is customers of the system, victims or beneficiaries of transformation that the service carried out. Actors within the system, those who carry out the transformation. Transformation process, K 
carried out by the system in converting input to output. Weltanschauung, that's the worldview that makes the transformation meaningful in the context of the system. Owners of the system, those with the authority to stop the transformation process. And environmental constraints, elements outside the system that it takes as given. Four conceptual models. Each root definition is elaborated to produce a conceptual activity model and that includes core activities to service the needs of the root definition. The elaboration results are the results of system thinking rather than of explicit references to existing organisations and processes. Five, six and seven look at feasible actions to improve the situation and they're based on the differences between the real world and the ideal world that was teased out at four. There's an awful lot more to it and once round the circle may not produce a complete solution to the problem. You may have to go through this a number of times. But it's dealing with a very complicated problem uh, in organisations, so-called messy organisations, Checkland's words. Um, an alternative to that uh, is uh, the rigorous soft methodology, RSM, which, uh, as it says at the bottom right there, follows the general practitioner approach, going to your doctor. If you go along to your doctor and say, doctor, I don't feel too well, but I've got no idea what's wrong with me, he will probably mutter something under his breath and then proceed through something like this routine. Step one, he will appreciate the broad area of your concern. He will find the symptoms causing that concern. He will find the implicit systems that, that those symptoms imply. In other words, the organs that might be at fault. Um, he will then group the, in, these implicit systems into sets and he will highlight set deficiencies compared with the ideal which he knows for your sex, height, age, etc. He will then propose a remedy, but before giving you the remedy, he will, or should, check that the remedy eliminates all the symptoms. Hmm. You can put that in diagrammatic form as so. Start at the top of issue and go around clockwise. Number one, nominate the issue and the issue domain, and so on. And you can follow that round to end up with very five proposals against original symptoms. Does it work? Yes. You get a resolution of the issue, and the issue effectively goes away, and yes, you get requirements. If no, uh, you have to go around again, of course. You haven't done it. The rigorous soft methodology can also be shown as a behaviour diagram. These are quite interesting, very uh, uh, elegant way of uh, presenting something quite complex. As it says in the column at the left, horizontally these are a sequence of IPOs, input, process, output. There's another one, input, processes, output. Input, process, output. Input, process, output. But in this direction, these various processes become part of an overall process. So vertically, a column of functions and activities forming a central process for the whole thing. The input column shows data, tools and methods, and the output column shows deliverables. The whole may be elaborated with each level, each IPO, forming a new complete behaviour diagram, and then all of the behaviour diagrams join together end to end. And it's altogether an exceedingly powerful method of thinking and expressing. It also cross-checks itself. It's almost impossible to do it wrong. Or if you do, for somebody else to see that you've made an obvious mistake. Beer's viable systems model that captures a lot of imagination with people. And you can see this here. Now what we have here is, on the right-hand side here, we have... Uh, the system, which consists actually of five systems. And on the left we have the environment, 
that these various five systems are working under. First of all, let's note it's recursive, uh, in that each of these down here is exactly the same as this up here. So this thing might represent, shall we say, some uh, organization which consists of three divisions. Okay, and um, there we go. This becomes system one. Of course, the, the various parts have to be coordinated at system two. And then system three is about cohesion, maintaining cohesion between all of the systems. Uh, and that's three star, which is about monitoring. System four is intelligence, looking into the future. Hence is the question, what's the environment going to look like in the future? And system five is policy, uh, identity and all that sort of thing. Okay, here's the words. System 5 at the end functions include setting context, establishing corporate identity, and quotes providing closure to internal dialogues, otherwise known as banging heads together. Another one of Hitchens uh, is the generic reference model. It's a reference model of any system, which is a bit of a bold claim. All systems exist, they have been being, for example, the solar system. Some systems not only exist, but they do things. They function. Um, elevators, transport, clocks, generators. The world is full of systems that do things. Uh, and then there are some systems, much rarer, that also uh, think and behave. Uh, and they either respond to stimulus or they have a clash between nature and nurture. And things that exist, function, and think and behave are humans, elephants, cetaceans, the dolphins and the whales, and uh, a car with a driver, largely because there's a human in it. So any system is a selection or combination of the three. All systems have being, some systems be, have being uh, and do things, and yet again some systems have being, do things and think and behave. Not forgetting, open systems face a continuing flux of energy, information and substance, yet maintain viability, which is the ability of a thing to maintain itself or recover its potentialities. There's, there's a, a very simple picture of the generic reference model at the highest level, level zero. And you can see the three arrows being at the bottom, doing top right, thinking top left. And being at the bottom is the easy one. Form management is made up of structure, uh, potential, that's to do with energy, and influences, well, influence is influence. Uh, function management is split up into three areas. Uh, mission, mission management that is, viability management, and resource management. And we can see at the left behaviour management, which is a bit more sophisticated, uh, that's about cognition, belief systems, which we've met already, uh, selection of behaviour, and intent. You can also see that stimulus goes into behaviour management, because it's about stimulus response. And we can also see that these three parts are not separate, they're all one, and they all interact with each other. So although we might look at them under separate headings, they are not separate. They are simultaneous uh, aspects of one whole. Now here's the function model, which as we've seen was made up of mission management in red at the top, resource management in blue at the bottom, and viability management in green in the middle. You can see them in their respective environments. Mission management is operates in an operational environment, um, and resource management operates in a resource environment. Viability provides platform for mission management. It provides the platform, as it were, make sure that everything is there and working. So it's about what's called SMESH, uh, synergy, all the parts working together. 
maintenance, making sure that anything that's broken is repaired. Um, evolution, um, change to uh, long-term changing ev um, environment. Survival, uh, if it doesn't survive it's not going to be much use. And survival is avoidance of detection, self-defense and damage to tolerance convention. And homeostasis or dynamic equilibrium. Most open systems aren't actually <coughs> stable in the conventional sense. They have a, um, a somewhat uneasy dynamic equilibrium. Uh, if you look at the operational environment at the top, coming from that you've got information, objectives, strategy and plans, then over to the right to execution and cooperation with others back into the operational environment. That's collecting information from the operational environment, which we, we humans do by looking and listening and feeling. Um, but um, uh, an aeroplane with a radar, for example, might use radar to collect information. Um, and strategy and plans might be predetermined. Uh, this is, as it were, generic. So it applies to any kind of system. Simply at the bottom, we've got resources. Uh, they are acquired, stored, distributed, converted uh, into a usable form as energy, and, and then disposal of the waste back into the resource environment. You can also see threats in here. We've got threats to information, threats to survival. We've got change affecting things. And we've got threats to um, acquiring and storing and disposing of resources. Um, and we've also got an open system flux of energy, information and substance, which as the figure actually shows, although not that overtly, the, these, uh, this flux is managed by mission resource, which is about managing the information flow, and resource management, which is man about managing the substance and energy flow. The last in the GRM is the GRM, the Generic Reference Model, the Behaviour Model. And you can see straight away that on the left it's got stimulus coming in, and on the right we've got response and intent coming out. But also, uh, going orthogonally, we've got nature at the top with a grey background, and we've got nurture at the bottom uh, with another grey background. So this is about nature versus nurture. Uh, and it's also about stimulus versus response. At the left we can see the stimulus come in. It's recognised by comparing it with what we know about world models, tacit knowledge and what we believe it's, go what we believe it's going to be uh, using the belief system. So what comes out of cognition is not uh, one for one the stimulus, it's our interpretation of the stimulus is what we believe it to be. Uh, on the basis of that selection of that interpretation we select our response, and that's based on our nature, how we would naturally respond to that sort of stimulus, and also based on experience. Have we had this before? Out of selection comes excitation, and uh, that's a result of nature again on one part, and motivation. Motivation comes in two forms, motivation to achieve and motivation to conform. So there's a lot of things going on in here. And of course, having looked at that, we can now look at nature there, and you can see uh, after Carl Jung, the top right, our nature is uh, characterised by collective unconscious with instinct and archetypes of behaviour, uh, our libido, aggression and energy, our character and emotion. Whereas our belief system is replete with beliefs, of course, roles, stereotypes, categories, values, ethics, morals, ideologies, and happily, training. Because our belief system can be, uh, can be swayed by training to believe and behave in particular ways, without which we really would have something of a problem. Anyway, there's the GRM behaviour model, much more complex than any of the other more models, and a lot softer too. Um, this is the generic reference model in CLM form, causal loop model form, in conflict. You can see two forces here, blue force, 
represented by one GRM, and Red Force represented by another GRM, and they're in conflict. Uh, Blue Force GRM is um, supported uh, from outside the operational environment by uh, a logistic system, by maintenance, by defence suppliers and by a procurement system. And you can see that the logistic system is uh, providing fresh resources every so often. And when we look at Red Force we see it's exactly the same. So we can create uh, a simulation which shows this um, in something like Stellar for example with these supporting it in Stellar and this in Stellar and the two engaged each other they would look pretty well much the same um, facing each other and we can vary the various parameters in there like how many resources uh, how often are they updated uh, what the decision making process is like and so forth all in there and we can produce complex simulations uh, really quite complex and they tell you quite a lot about what's likely to happen in particular situations since you can instantiate this to be for example that could be one battleship that's another battleship and all the various values you put in there would be for uh, different classes of battleship so they're each represented by a full GRM instantiated with appropriate values for combat. Forces uh, are then interconnected through a representative environment and let simulated battle commence. So conclusion. System thinking. It's a vast subject and we've only surface only scratched the surface here. I've shown some principal ideas and methods uh, and methodologies. But there are many more to be discovered, some rigorous, others less so. The challenge for all of them, however, is to get to the heart of the matter. And it is altogether a most rewarding and useful exercise. I commend systems thinking to you as very important and fundamental to systems, systems thinking, systems engineering, system theory, system science. It, it's really in the heart of the matter.